Uh, through the Chair, uh, my understanding is um, Mary is working on that at the moment and looking at what other councils do. We haven't been able to find another council with a specific disclo uh, protected disclosure for the elected members, so we're um, considering what the best option is. Okay, so we can expect a day yep, the, the next, next meeting. meeting. Thank you. And similarly, with the tax risk management strategy, I'm aware, Ms. Harrison, that there you there's a pile of information on your in your office that you're going through looking at previous work. Can you give us any indication of progress on that? Uh, so through the chair, this issue has been looked at probably six or seven times previously by um, different uh, firms around the country. So what I'm trying to do is collate that information and um, do it. Uh, I'm, I'm wanting to do this exercise jointly with TDC. So it's just taking some time with everyone working on LTP to get onto that, so, um, but I really do want to make sure that we're um, spending our money effectively if we're going to undertake that research again. Thank you, Ms Harrison. Are there any uh, discussions or comments on that from members of the committee or attendees? Okay, thank you. If not, could I ask that somebody uh, move that we receive the status report and its attachments? Thank you, uh, Councillor Goldberg. Thank you, Mr Murray. No further discussion. All those in favour, please say aye. Okay. Against? Carried. We move to um, item eight, key organisational risks, and welcome Mr Vaughan to the table. Good morning, Steve. Good morning, Ian. Welcome. Those who have been recorded. Goes. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I don't have anything to add to the report as presented. There's one small matter of explanation in relation to a proposed exercise for uh, dealing with major disruptions to the organisation, which you will see in the report has been postponed a number of times. Uh, most recently, that's the result of central government action in requiring us to deal with the regional transport strategy at an unusual speed. And the only opportunity to do so was on the same day that we scheduled the exercise for. So it's being rescheduled yet again. Thank you, Mr Vaughan. I'll open the report up for questions from members of the committee. Councillor Dolberg. <coughs> Thank you, Mr Chair. Just on the overview and comment really about the better information on risk related to legal compliance. Also seen a uh, report on, which I thought was very good, I might add, about the, our legal, I suppose you say, um, events or challenges or activity. I'd like a bit of an explanation on that, thanks. Uh, yes, most certainly, and through you, Mr Chair. Um, two matters here. We have, we have, we were for quite some part of last year working on um, establishing a panel of legal firms to be literally on call in fact, for both us and Tasman District Council. That matter was concluded, and I think, um, uh, Nicky Harrison may be able to correct me, I think in November, late November or December of last year. Um, so we've actually got that now in place, and it's working pretty well. Um, we've also done a little bit of reorganising of the way in which, or the lines in which our internal um, our senior legal advisor reports through to senior management and that's helped matters no end. Um, so both of those things, plus as you will see later in this agenda, uh, there's an initiative to advise this committee of the pending legal matters so you have a better understanding of those. And that's reduced the possibility of things going wrong, which is really what risk is about, um, quite substantially in our judgment. Thank you. Councillor Dolbeck. Any other questions on the report for Mr Vaughan? I, just one question, uh, or really just asking for a bit, bit more clarity, Mr um, Vaughan, on item 3.4 you talk about most business units rapidly improving their, their risk management process, which is good, um, but some, some issues around consistency uh, bet, between the reports. Um, Thank you, Mr. Can you Chairman. How much of a concern that. that is for you, or, or uh, okay. where that's going fundamentally? So we can I, I consistency, think... inconsistencies are always an issue. Yes. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. That does need a little explanation. 
Um, we, as you're aware, uh, manage most of our risks with business units. That's where most of the effective decisions are made in the organisation to run the organisation day to day. We have had um, some difficulty persuading particularly people who've come new to this area that they should assess those risks using a consistent council framework rather than looking specifically at the risks to them achieving their bit of it. So that if I take an example, if a, if a particular business unit hypothetically has a very large project and it says that not finishing that project is a real problem for us, but if we look at that consistently across the whole organisation, the effect of that project being done or not done is relatively small in terms of, for example, failure of the council to deliver a certain service, or the possibility that we may end up in court, to go back to the recent thing, then the, the assessment needs to be in relation to the council's uh, overall objectives, not simply in relation to something which is sitting in front of the business unit. And getting that change to happen is taking a little time. Thank you, Mr Vaughan. Any, any questions on the report or the tables that follow it? Yes, uh, yes. Councillor Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Chair. If I can have your indulgence, I'm not on the committee. <coughs> Through you to Mr Vaughan. So the greatest risk for this council is in fact the lack of adequate recruitment you know, people. It's, it's people that's the, the problem. That's the biggest risk. Am I correct in saying um, it's, it's in a group of risks which we bring to your attention because it continues to be a relatively significant one. On this table in this report, the largest risk to the Council doing its job is actually an earthquake in five minutes time. It's a large disruptive event which, which destroys parts of our infrastructure. Now there's only, in, in the real world there is only so much we can do about that. We can be prepared to deal with you know, the fixed pipes, <laughs> for argument's sake, but only to a certain extent. We, can, you know, we can't duplicate everything. The organisation simply doesn't have the money. But up in the, that next group is the fact that we are a relatively small or mid-sized organisation competing in a market for fairly specialised skills. And so we continue to have to work at that. Um, when I went round and did, collected the data for this report, <coughs> um, we're reasonably confident that we're doing reasonably well in that. We continue to have vacancies, we're continuing to fill them. And apologies for not saying that through the chair. Yes, the chair. Thank you, Mr Vaughan. Are there any further discussions or questions of Mr Vaughan on the risk report? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Murray. But, um, if there are no further questions, we'll take your your, your comments now. Um, thank you. Uh, through the chair, look, if we've moved into the discussion phase, I'm happy to move the report um, so that we can go into that phase. Thank you, uh, Mr. Murray. So uh, it's seconded by Councillor Dolberg. So uh, we'll take discussion on it now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the report, um, uh, to me, feels pretty much um, wrote or it's, you know just an iteration of the last one and when I have a look at the risks in here relative to previous reports really we haven't moved our risk assessment along the lines um, up or down which I sort of understand and accept. The bit um, that I was reflecting on was the later reports um, particularly around internal audit um, and the issues raised by Mr Vaughan around um, obtaining staff and the question I go to is is given we've got a whole lot of controls in this report which says we manage our risks by these controls, how effective are these controls really working in our organisation when we've got um, issues or problems with staff recruitment and people not being in the roles? And if I read the internal audit report correctly, senior staff and staff not having time to actually think about um, how effective their controls are that they're looking after and, um, uh, and 
can they do that better and are they actually working properly, which of course safeguards us from these risks which are in this report. So I sort of started bottom up and looked at the controls and go, well, if we haven't got people and they're not thinking about the controls and we don't know how well they are, how, how good are we managing our risk? And so it sort of circulated up that way for me. So, so I, was, I then started to reflect on um, uh, another piece to this, which was the develop, development internally of our risk management um, in the organisation. And we talked quite a bit a while ago about um, developing a risk management framework, which would, I would presume would explain um, who's, in, who's, in, who's responsible for the dot points in here and, and just what they're doing around thinking about those and improving and enhancing those. And so really my comment, um, in a long way round, and I appreciate that, is really how far away are we from getting the risk management framework into place so that then I can be a lot more comfortable that the controls that we've got in here which are managing these risks are actually effective and, and, and implemented appropriately. Appreciating that right now we've got a bit of a, a, a bit of a resourcing problem, where people seem to be too busy doing the doing and not thinking about these matters, um, which flows through the whole paper. So I was looking for you know, a time frame around when that framework might be able to be developed and put onto the table, so that we can clearly understand who is responsible for um, particular control points and how do we know they're implemented effectively. Thank you, Mr. Murray. Mr. Vaughan, did you want to comment on that? Um, I think I'd refer um, through you, Mr. Murray, uh, um, Mr. Chair, Mr. Murray, to the um, comment which the chair actually raised, which is that um, we are internally satisfied that we are shifting the organisation from each business unit saying all I'm concerned about is my particular item sitting in front of me, the particular problem which I might have with the project, as I referred to before, towards we're all assessing risks on the same basis for what the council is here to do. Now, I think that if I was to reflect from this, the last meeting to this one, roughly a quarter, then we've made quite a lot of progress in that area. Are we there completely? No, I don't think so. But are we better than we were three months ago? Absolutely. Just as a, if I could just follow up on, on that in terms of, I, I understand that, I understand where, where we're at. I think what I don't have sort of clearly in my mind, and it may come back, I don't want to put words in Mr. Murray's mouth, may come back to this, this framework concept. Hmm is while we're doing that, well, what is it that we're aspiring to? What does success look like uh, in, in this space that, that can say, okay, now we have the best possible uh, risk process, whether it's a framework, whether it's a, a methodology, whatever it is. It's, it's a, we're on a journey. We, we accept that at, at this stage. It's, a, it's not a, a risk mature organization. Um, how, do, how does this committee know what it is that, uh, that we're looking to become? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a very good question. I'll try and give you a short answer and then add a bit of explanation. The, the short answer to the question is the goal to be aimed at is the organisation understands all of its risks and manages all those risks to within its criteria. The risk criteria are a is a document which was approved by this committee and then the council. Um, and ha have, so there are two components to that. Can we spot everything coming at us? And then have we got sufficient in place to be confident, not that there is no risk at all, because that's an impossibility for any organisation, least of all one which has so many functions as this one does, but are we managing those risks to a reasonable level, as the council itself has agreed should be the case? And are we, again, I go back to the comment, are we there completely? No, I don't think so. But are we, make, are we moving in the right direction? Absolutely, yes. So those two things, knowledge of our risks and enough tools to manage them within our criteria within the judgments we have made about how much risk is acceptable. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Wong. Councillor Delbert? Yeah, I'm kind of... Kind of, I understand what that last statement was. My comment is, so what does success look like? Do we fully functioning? We've all got all the right people in the right spots. We're matching our budgets. Um, I think that's probably what we're thinking here. Or is another document that just says we're managing risks? Thank you, Councillor Gilbert. Um, <laughs> I don't think I can do much better um, through you, Mr Chair, so in response to that other than to say we cannot have sorry in my experience i have never seen an organization which has no risks it's it's not a reasonable thing to do how, how close are we to getting to the point where we are fully aware of all of the risks coming at us and we have put in place enough controls to keep those at a reasonable level Again, I go back to the, the, the original the comment I made a few minutes ago. So, if you if you if you like, if you set that sort of statement up as a target, you, I, I suppose you're going to get closer and closer to it. But I can walk out of this room this morning and talk to a member of staff and discover something which we've never seen before. And we have to be, have the machinery available to then deal with that. And we've had a few of those in the last couple of years. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Warren. I, I, I think... Um, yes, uh, Chief Executive. So, um, as, as Mr. Vaughan has pointed out, we are slowly making progress, but um, um, we are, are short of staff. Um, and while we will slowly make progress, I suspect so, what, in my view, what happens at the moment is we um, um, uh, an issue arises. Our, our managers are, are busy; they fail to sometimes spot a symptom early, early in the process because it's not a big symptom, and they're busy doing other things. Uh, they spot it later. We react slightly too slowly um, and sc scramble well, but um, it still aff affects our. Um, our our reputation um, and can sometimes affect costs and, and times of, of time of a project. So uh, the mayor on her whiteboard, the one that's behind her desk, she, one of the things she has written there is, is organisational excellence. And and I, she indicated she'd like that within six months of me starting and I said I think that's a three year journey. So I think that in terms of being excellent at managing our risks, we're on that, that three year journey as well. I, I need more bodies on seats, and the council has is supportive of that. It's they're fronted as part of the LTP, lifting um, council performance, uh, managing risk as, as part of that that lifting council performance. Um, I also need people to to be smart, uh, to use their judgment, to understand that uh, what Mr. Vaughan is providing is a, is a tool. It's it's not the solution on its own. You just just can't tick the boxes and think that you've done it. <coughs> so there is also that. Uh, culture change of encouraging people to to use their own judgment and and make make decisions so there is a whole lot of things where you know, as mr. Vaughan's introducing a, uh, a system that encourages people to th think about the big picture and how we respond to these but I also need more people with with good judgment and more time to, to apply that judgment and it's yeah I'm expecting that we won't will only see uh, little steps every three months, but I think what I would like to think is in 18 months' time, when we look back, we will have seen, wow, look where we have where we, where we have come from. Thank you, Mr. Doherty. And I, I just want to add um, something too that was going through my mind when when, when Mr. Vaughan was uh, was speaking. I think I think we should take these uh, thoughts and questions from from this committee as as actually a very positive sign because I think we've come a heck of a long way in the last 18 months, and you know, I agree with you, and, and, and probably in the last couple of years from where we were. Yeah. And it is becoming a more risk-aware organisation, and, and as such, I think the expectation of, the, of maturity is, is improving. And I think that's a credit to the organisation that we're in that stage. Um, and, and, and I think we should be as, aspiring to those next stages within the resource constraints that we've got. But uh, you know, I, I do think we recognise we've come a long way, so thank you for that. 
I'll take, did you want to speak, sorry, as a, I'll take Councillor Barker first and then Councillor Courtney. Yeah. So <coughs> Thank you, Mr Chairman. There's one area that, that I have a concern about, which uh, I think the risk that I worry about is actually on us, and that is um, Category 4, Management of Contracts. The, the section, what do we see this as a risk? Oversight of contractors can impact on our objectives to keep people safe, operate within the budget, deliver quality services and maintain a high reputation. What's missing in there is, to my, to my view at the moment, is and delivery on time of contracts. And why that comes to mind is that we're so long past the original completion date for the Stoke Community Centre. And uh, that has reputational impact on council and just that mere thing alone puts it in the risk map in my view a higher than medium impact so it's just a comment thank you councillor barker uh, did, did you want to respond to that or i'll go to councillor courtney's um, question there's perhaps a little bit of information which might help in that respect um, I'm not sure that this matter has ever come formally before this committee, but one of the other jobs, if I can put it that way, that I was instructed to do when I came here was to overhaul our system of contracting. We have, as an organisation, in rough terms, 75% of the money which comes in through the door, largely from ratepayers, goes out through the door to contractors. We did not have adequate tools for that when I came here. I think I can say that without um, any fear of, of contradiction. We've got most of those in place. What we do have, because we started that process in 2016, is a fairly large wave of older contracts which still have to be brought up to standard. And in addition, we have, as it says in this report, some issues with properly recording that information, which we're also working towards fixing, if I can put it that way. So we, this contracts area is quite clearly for an organisation which does so much of its work by contracting people to do it, a thing which takes time to fix. And so, yes, it's another one of these areas where we're getting the tools in place. Have we got there yet? No. Thank you, Mr. Vaughan. Uh, Councillor Courtney. Thank you. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, I'm prompted to sort of comment too after Mr. Do our Chief Executive mentioned that we're short on people. I want to go back to that because they are our greatest resource, of course, above all else. And I'm just wondering, through you to Mr. Vaughan, the Improving the work environment should have certainly assist that, and we're working on that, aren't we, going up through Civic House and upgrading. Mm. But then I... And you see, risk too, for me, is a difficult one, because I want our staff to be bold. And here we're dwelling on risk all the time, and another word for... You know, I want them to be bold, I want them to be confident. I want them to have a fantastic work environment, where they feel relaxed and able to speak their minds. Mm. So... Now I'm going to come around to remuneration, and I know you're not in that area, but um, when we talk about risks and a fully functional council, and what we need is people, and that's the whole nub of the thing. So um, could you have a thought or two on that, please? Um, I might defer to the Chief Executive on that point, because I know that he has considerable conversations with council on exactly this topic um, through you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Can we add that to you, uh, Mr. Dorothy? Um, so, absolutely, I agree that um, uh, in an organisation such as ours, uh, people are our, our most, most important resource. We can give them uh, good systems and processes to make their job easier. Um, and your talk about you want staff to be, to be bold. Um, I don't know if I quite want them to be bold, but I do want them empowered to make decisions. I want a, a fast... Uh, adept, responsive organisation, and to do that, that's not by micromanaging. That's by encouraging people to to make decisions after assessing the risks 
and then, then making a decision and moving the organisation forward. That's accepting that sometimes we will make mistakes, but then there's a conversation about, um, okay, what went wrong with your assessment there, uh, and let's not make the same mistake twice. Um, so that's, that's the type of organisation I'm looking for, uh, where staff enjoy their work because they are empowered, and they have good working conditions, and the council is supportive of that too. I'm, I'm very grateful. Um, yeah, um, if ever I'm asked what's the most important thing for me, it's a, it's a happy, well-performing team. And if it's a happy team, then almost invariably it's a well-performing team. Compared to other local authorities in, in our area, perhaps, for a start? Uh, look, we pay um, uh, market rates. Um, we can only, I believe, in being a fair payer. I don't think we can, as a local authority, using ratepayers' money, be um, uh, generous. We, we can be fair. Um, we'll recognise good performance, pay above the median for our, our outstanding performers. But it is critical that we um, we do pay the fair market rate. I don't believe in anything called a sunshine bonus. Um, but and if we're paying a fair market rate uh, and providing a good working environment, a positive working environment, then staff enjoy the place. They're more likely to stay. But I'm still vulnerable if a consultant or a contractor wants to to steal one of my top staff and pay, you know, well above the odds. Then. I, I struggle to compete with that. In Capital I lost staff for $40,000 pay increases. And, and um, I, I couldn't match that. I couldn't promote them. You just have to wish them well. I hope maybe one day they'll come back. So th that's my, my, my view. I'm not a CE that's interested in driving down terms and conditions. I'm interested in paying uh, fair rates. Thank you, Mr. Doherty. Are there any other points of discussion? Risk. Uh, Councillor Barker. Just perhaps the point that I raised before, perhaps the um, what, why do we see this as a risk section of the of the um, template could include on time activity in the future. So, so noted. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Barker. If there's no further uh, points of discussion, the motion has been. Uh, Moved and seconded, so all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Vaughan. Uh, we move to item nine, uh, the corporate report. And... Welcome. Welcome to the table. Any items of highlight or update? Monsieur, you want to provide? Take the, the report as read, but uh, is there anything you want to highlight before we ask for questions? Uh, good morning, everyone. Through the chair. Um, it is included in the report, but I would just like to highlight the section on the February storms. Um, we are getting, obviously, more and more information as time goes on with that. So uh, for this report, which is to the end of March, there is some 400,000 dollars of expenditure, unbudgeted expenditure, that is flowing through um, these figures. Um, also, pleasingly, I would like to highlight um, that on, as you'll see from the capital graphs, which I think are on page, ooh, let me get to it, uh, page 45, um, that overall we are on forecast to the end of March for our capital expenditure. So that's, uh, I'd just like to highlight that. There are obviously overs and unders in individual projects and also within the activities. Other than that, um, yes, I'd like to just point out on page 37, paragraph 426, uh, the, la the last sentence should have been updated. Um, the bar graph, this is the capital again, records year-to-date expenditure against forecast budget by activity. We brought those two graphs into line um, for this report. So that aside, um, my view is that this report is largely business as usual. Um, no alarm bells ring for me. And I'll take it as read. Thank you, Ms. Hughes. So are there any questions for clarification of the report before I 
Councillor Dolberg. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, page 45 in really the actual budget or forecast to the budget carriers. I see one's sort of 16 mil and one's 40 mil. I've got that right. Is that that discussion about um, us getting our projects back to the resources, the available resources? Through the chair, that, that is correct. Uh, the, the forecast was made during the LTP progress, uh, sorry, um, process earlier in the year um, when we were having those discussions about what council can can realistically achieve. Um, all of the projects were looked at pretty much individually, I think, in order to get to that figure, and it does come to what we did expect, which was around the 40 million mark. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just through something, I, I just thought maybe a note on that. If I was an external person reading that, these are, are public documents. They're probably noting most people probably see there's twenty million dollars difference, and maybe we note in there that. Thank you, Councillor Dobbs. Save, think save people, save people writing in. I think that would be a useful addition. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, would somebody? Move that the report be received. Thank you, uh, Councillor Barker. Thank you, Councillor Dolbeck. Uh, any discussion on the report? Councillor Courtney? Through, through you, not, just another question actually to Tracy. Through you. The, you you're proud that this uh, um, forecast on capital expenditure is you know, on, on, on track. Um, do you see that continuing through into the future? Through the chair, um, yes, certain, I certainly hope so. Um, there are some projects that are, are moving ahead of schedule, and some projects that are going slightly slower. But on balance, we're tracking toward um, our 40 million for this year, or the approximate 40 million for this year. And we've done that by um, rephasing those projects that um, had risk in them. That meant that they were unlikely to be achieved this financial year, so we haven't actually stopped doing anything. We've just adjusted the phasing to make sure that it's more uh, appropriate to the delivery of the project. Can Council take, through you Mr Chair, can Council take some credit for this? Because we have cut our cloth and decided wisely, taking the advice of the Chief Executive, that we uh, bring our capital expenditure into line with what's achievable and I think the figure was 40 million so um, are we uh, in some way uh, being proved right with this that's what I want to know. Uh, through the chair I think the chief executive's decision to um, to adjust our spend was a good one and um, yes I think it is it is reflecting that. Thank you. Any other points, uh, Councillor Dolberg? Just a question on, um, I'm not sure what page, uh, 46, maybe page four, yeah, page 47. Okay, um, Queen's Garden toilets, I know that came up a few times in the long term plan, so I, so I need to ask, mainly on the red item on time, do we have, a, do we have some update on that? Through the chair. The Queen's Cardin's Toilets um, was tendered and awarded to Watson Hughes. And they did a good thing in the fact that they told us that they had a resourcing issue, that the, um, the contract manager uh, that they had lined up to do the work had moved on and that they couldn't start it. They could have started it if they wanted to, but they wouldn't have, um, they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have worked efficiently without a, a good contract manager. So they've delayed the start, um, and it's reaching a point now where um, I've gone back to them and said, look, we need to reassess um, your capability in delivering this project, and that's where we're at. We're just assessing whether or not they will have the resources, um, and obviously we want all the resources to be devoted to the Green Meadows Centre, um, and I think that in the near future we'll come back to Council recommending that, um, that we either retender or look at other options to deliver the project that, that exclude what's in use. So through yes, I'm assuming that same contract just hasn't got the staff and we're when we are adjusting our thoughts along that line. Through the chair, that's correct. And um, it is positive that they've told us that and that they haven't just started and then that we've learnt it and the, the, um, the project's become problematic as Green Meadows had. So that is a positive. Um, we're 
we're not committing to starting until we have until they have their um, ducks lined up, and if they don't, then we'll come back to council with an um, alternative recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Dobberg. Councillor Barker. Thank you, Mr Chair. Could we um, have a bit of analysis on, on the capital expenditure, particularly the Green Meadows, the extra 590k, not reflected in the graphs yet, and the the, the uh, warning page on page 39, which shows us that um, what was it, $10.7 million under expenditure. So we're, we're, we're tracking nicely along the forecast line, but we're $10 million below the, the actual budget line. Has that Green Meadows one had any effect upon those outcomes? Uh, through the chair, Green Meadows is one project in about 150 that we're delivering. It's about it's about five to seven million out of um, the over the original program, which was 60. So it, it has probably had an effect, but we have to remember that um, there are <laughs> over over 140 projects that are running really successfully. So I'm not sure if that answers the question, but I think it it, it will be having an effect. But um, we can't lose sight of everything that is going really, really well that Council doesn't hear about because it doesn't need to. So looking into the future with the, with the forecast, is the forecast that that gap of 10, currently 10.7 million, was that going to decrease? Are we going to get nearer to what we actually planned? Yeah. Through the Chair, um, that, that 10.7 million gap is against approved budget rather than against forecast. So I don't see, well, please correct me if I'm wrong, Mr Davies, I, I don't see that that forecast is going to increase to be more towards the approved budget. So the gap um, of 10.7 million is likely to increase. That's the point I'm trying to get to where we're going to be under spent on capital this year. It, it, that's that's great. I mean, my understanding and is, is that that was the process that was approved when we did the variation um, to, at the time of the LTP when we changed the uh, the approved budget to an approved forecast, which had that significant variation, which is highlighted, in fact, on the graph. I think it's on page 40, 45. So we will we will continue to see that uh, that gap, and as it expands as as, as those lines widen as the year proceeds, that's how that we will see that increase. Mr Murray. Um, thank you. Um, just a, a, a quick overall question. Um, just on some of the variances that are coming through, particularly in the expenditure lines, um, appreciating that we are um, bang on budget, really, and if it's not slightly ahead, which is very pleasing, um, given we've got a, um, quite a, a large account. Um, in the in areas like the forestry, um, because my relationship with the forestry committee, I, I, I'm aware of the revenue and expenses that are heading through there, and there are a couple of the variances highlighted here. But are some of these other variances around program maintenance, and um, uh, for instance, the the one with the Nelson Regional Development Agency events fund being a little bit over, are they going to the relative committees for them to keep an eye on and comment on? Through the Chair, I'm, I'm not entirely uh, sure what goes to the relevant committees. Um, I'm more than happy for this report to be distributed to those committees. That, that's certainly not a problem. Um, the information in those variance reports comes from the, uh, the people on the ground, if you like, the, the managers of those areas. So I, I'm just not aware of what the process is, where that might feed up through to the committee. Further question, Mr. Murray? Or further comment? Well, I'm, I'm not sure it's a question for Ms. Hughes at all, but um, I'm just pondering as to, um, given the size of some of these, whether um, I don't even know where in the council um, an overspend for Nelson Regional Development Agency Events Fund would go um, for oversight, 
but um, but or, or even um, you know the maintenance. Um, I mean, I'm just picking them randomly. Uh, you know, water supply, uh, 45 overspend. I would have thought that was in the Works and Infrastructure Committee or something. If it, if it was a significant variance that they needed to know about um, in their particular area. Um, when I look at these reports, I tend to go very, very high level and go, well, are, are we as an organisation tracking? How are we going? You know, is our debt levels right? Is the capital going OK? Are we within policy for um, debt to rates and all that sort of stuff? Um, but I, I sort of look at these variances and just sort of wonder, how does, how does a $507,000 grant overspend actually get signed off? Um, just, a, 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 yeah. No. Just a question. There's, oh. there's probably, there would be processes within processes here, I'm sure. Yeah. Ms Harrison will respond. So, so, sorry, so, so through, through the Chair, just to be clear with the NRDA um, <laughs> overspend, it isn't an overspend, it's a reserve that we run in Council. Um, that's, that they effectively, we, we made a, Council made a decision a number of years ago is that um, rather than just paying all the money across to them, we'd hold it in reserves here and pay it across. So they're drawing down last year's reserves. So. It's actually a reserve variance. It's not actually a pay now, so there would be no um, way that that would go through. I, I mean, it is an interesting question. This is a finance report. This is a finance committee. So you are the holders of this information. So if you do want stuff pushed out to the committees, um, you know that's probably where we need some direction from. The, there are capital um, reports to be going up to works and infrastructure, etc., where there are capital requests and variances, but really um, the, you know, the officers have KPIs around spending these budgets and, and I suppose this is the, the forum that the finances are reported through, certainly from an, an operating expenditure and revenue perspective. I know um, Planning and Rec have quite detailed quarterly reports that go up around building consent numbers, resource consent numbers um, and um, income related to those, but they're not really specifically at this level of detail. Ms. Murray, did you want to follow that up? Well, I don't know how far we should sort of go with this, because we're starting to now getting into some planning around structure, but um, uh, I, I suppose that it, it just sort of highlights for me that there's a wee bit of a, um, an issue around how council committees are structured relative to the organisations and activities of council, um, of the operation itself. Um, so I, I suppose I, I suppose it's harking back to a little bit of a bugbear of mine where, um, where I like to know who's responsible for what within particular activities in terms of a governance framework and then how that's supported by management and have some clear lines. And what I'd really sort of, um, what I really wouldn't like to see is, is that stuff's falling through the cracks because it sort of doesn't have a place to go to, but yet someone's managing it. I'm very sure management have got all the lines down there, but um, so, um, some some matters, and, and I look, I, again, there's a materiality type issue here where you wouldn't put every dollar and cent up, but if you were running significantly under or significantly over in a particular area, you would report it somewhere, but the question is as to who and how does that line up? And that's the bit I think we've got missing here. Um, so I'm not sure how much further we can take this comment. It's not. It's not. Um, it's not the finance report per se. Um, there's nothing wrong with this. It's just how do, how how does the organisation respond to this? And it's um, probably a question for a bit more pondering and a bit more consideration outside of the meeting, perhaps. Thank you, uh, Mr. Murray. It may may also be a, a conversation in due course at, at a governance committee or somewhere like that in that, in that space. Councillor Barker. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. I I've been pondering it from a governance committee point of view and I reflect upon the fact that we used to cover this communications matter before the, before the um, event of the Audit Risk and Finance Committee. This was normally handled at governance committee and the governance committee comprises, what did comprise then anyway, chairs of all the committees. So that was the time when I sat at the chair of the governance committee. I could point out to the chair of the relevant committee the matters that were in the finance report that were of concern to them, and that was how it was dealt with. Now, we've evolved. We haven't got that system to the same extent now that we did. A solution could be that the Audit Risk and Finance Committee could, where it sees variances or sees concerns, 
that the Audit Risk and Finance Committee can report to either the Governance Committee or the relevant committee. So if the relevant committee does take ownership of a problem with it, its sphere of the responsibility by way of a, a report to it. So just a, just a thought, and again, it's a, it's a high level structure thing that we're that we're going to have to sort out. And I take on board what John said. Thank you, uh, Councillor Barker. Uh, did you want to follow that up before I go to Councillor Delberg? Just a small point there, Mr Chair. The, um, this document's uh, available to, to all councillors. So my question is, yeah, I appreciate we could be sending it off to different places, but everyone can actually read this. It's a case of then whether we need a highlight if it's very significant. Thank you. To add to it, uh, my comments are based on the fact that I believe the committees should be responsible, should have responsibility for their areas of operation. Thank you. And, and following on from that, I suppose if I reflect on what happens in, in the forestry group is we look at that as a specific matter, you know, how much revenue we've got, how much have we spent. Um, so I sort of look at that and I go, yeah, I know all about that, Tick. Um, but I, I, I just wonder, I don't, wouldn't even, again, a bad example, but <laughs> if, I, if I go back, who, who would actually look at um, the, you know, the, unpro the programmed and based maintenance costs are less than budget? Who would look at that um, and be concerned about that? I mean, I'm, ha I'm very happy that we have to balance our books and this report tells me we're balancing our books. But in terms of that swing and roundabout, I th and I, I agree, it needs to go to the chairs, but is there stuff, does everyone do that? I don't know. Um, and that's a wee bit informal and a wee bit loose in my mind. So anyway, yeah, I think it's just something that needs to be revised and looked at as part of the committee structures. Thank you, Councillor Barker. Thank you, Mr Murray. Are there any further comments or discussions? The report has been moved and seconded, so uh, would those in favour please say aye. aye. Against? Carried. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Tracy. We move now to item 10 and welcome Ms Anderson to the table. Sorry, Lynn, is the, uh, take the report as read. Is there any um, points of highlight or amendment you want to make? Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I think we can take it as read. However, the, uh, there are a couple of minor things, and, and one thing is just to um, advise that the contract renewals audit, those that's gone in front of SLT, that went in front of SLT yesterday. And it's just to reiterate that um, the focus of this report is that, you know, we, we are reasonably up to date, but as we've discussed um, a lot through this entire meeting, um, there are issues in relation to resources in the organisation and we need to address that and address the risks and how we deal with the risks appropriately. And this paper uh, addresses that as well. So that was the focus of the report. Thank you, Ms Anderson. So questions on the report? If I'm If there are no questions, would somebody move and second it before I open for discussion? Open the report for any discussions on the report. To Murray. Um, thank you. Um, I, I suppose it, it is, um, we are where we are and it is what it is, but um, I'd just, um, I suppose, reiterate my earlier concern that we have landed here and, um, uh, and appreciate we've got to make this move um, and make this change uh, to the plan moving forward um, in the short term. Um, however, I think 
we need to be very aware that um, the risk around our control environment, and, that, uh, and, and that's a good one, is being severely undermined at the moment by the lack of people thinking about this. So, um, you know, we, we need to flag that. Um, and I've certainly flagged that. There's not much we can do other than get people in to start looking at it, which is good, and we're working on that. That's acknowledged that we need to take a breath and move forward quickly. Thank you, Mr Murray. I'm sure that's a, a point the Chief Executive is and, and, and the Internal Auditor are, are well aware of. Are there any other points to raise or discussions on this report? If there aren't, the report has been moved and seconded. I ask all those in favour to please say aye. aye. Against? Carried. Thank you. We move to the summary of new or outstanding significant risks. And same same point, any items you'd like to emphasise uh, or, or uh, update? Um, no, we'll just take that one as read, I think. Thank you. I'll take any questions. Thank you. Any questions of clarification from Ms Anderson? Mr Murray? Yeah, thank you. Just one question. Um, on page 58, um, uh, there's two items here. There's business planning continuity, or business continuity planning and delegations. Um, at the bottom of the delegations on the bottom right-hand box, it says these items are on track for completion by the end of June 2018. So I understand that we've got a process and a progress going um, in terms of what's happening there. Business continuity, though, um, do we have a buy when for the business continuity um, progress? Through the chair, I think it's in July sometime. Mr Vaughan should be able to help with that. Thank you very much. Um, I alluded in my report to the fact that we had had to postpone the exercise, which is the next step in testing our business, our capability to continue business under large adverse events from, um, and I think I've got the state correct, last Friday, the 11th. Um, and the date is still to be decided, or was decided yesterday, and I wasn't there, I'm sorry. Uh, so through the chair, the business continuity um, test will be the 27th of, of July, um, but I just want to emphasise that that is really just a test and, and there'll be stuff and learnings that will come out of that that will yep. help us establish um, um, what we need to be going forward. So it is an ongoing piece of work. <laughs> Thank you, Ms Murray. Thank you, Mr Vaughan. Any other questions? Clarification on the report? What would... Uh, could I have somebody move and second that report, please? Councillor Delberg. Councillor Barker. Any further discussion before we put the motion? If not, I'd ask all those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against? Carried. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Move to item 12, the Health and Safety Wellbeing Report, and welcome Mr Hughes to the table. Normal process, welcome, updates or emphasis, um, or take it as read. Um, so I, I do have some updates. There was one contractor incident in late February that didn't make it into the report because it, it didn't make it into our database in time. Um, so that was where a, a weed control contractor's worker slipped and, and steep terrain had to be evacuated by helicopter um, and, and received some, some injuries. Um, however, there has, we have received a, an investigation report from the contractor and, and that's, I couldn't see any issues with that. Um, and, so, and further updates, obviously in the six weeks since the report was written, um, security incidents, there's been a number of security incidents at the, at the Brook, uh, Hol Brook Valley Holiday Park. Um, main, most of those were a result of people that were moved from, from Rutherford Park to the Brook Camp and have now since gone from the Brook Camp, I'm not sure where they are at the moment, possibly back at, at Rutherford Park. Um, so that's, I guess, a risk that's, uh, that's been there. Um, a recent, recent thing we've been focusing on. And that's, the, yeah, the key updates I've got. Questions, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Mr Hughes. Any questions, clarification for Mr Hughes? 
Councillor Dolbeck. Hey, just picking up on that um, Team Pre campus at the Brook Valley, at the Brook Camp, um, I'm assuming we have some sort of process that covers this all off how many days or whatever they're allowed and how that process works through. Yes, uh, through the chair, we, we, there's a maximum of, um, I believe it's seven days at, at, the, at the Brook Valley Camp for, for regular campers, and that was how we moved these people on. Basically, they did leave willingly at the end of their, their time and moved back to Rutherford Park. Um, we were prepared to trespass them at that point be, from the camp because of their behaviour and the risks to staff and other customers. There was, yeah, it, was, it was quite considerable. Thank you, Councillor Dolby. Just to follow up on that then, so I'm kind of getting that, if I'm looking up the camp and we say you introduce a different clientele, I suppose the word would be, is there sort of security measures and there's a cost structure to this or how do we, I'm just going to say, comfort the people who are our existing people at the camp? Uh, through the chair, I mean that's a very good question, but there, there was a number of things put in place. So, historically, there's been uh, security at the camp over the peak summer period. This year, that that security coverage was extend had been extended and, and was still in place. And when this issue arose in, in the heat of it, a weekend where it was particularly bad, there was a number of, of incidents involving these people. Um, we actually put a second security guard on to support the uh, the staff. Um, it's, it wasn't a solution, but it was what we could do at the time. So we did put controls in place, and yes, there was, was cost associated with that. Um, but there was no, no question of, of doing it. Uh, you know, there was, when I asked for these things to be done, there was no question about, about doing them quickly. Thank, thank you. Um, I'll take Mr Murray and then the Chief... Oh, sorry, was that on that same topic? Yes, so, so I'll ask uh, the Chief Executive to comment on that topic and then to Mr Murray. So we trialled the idea of using vouchers um, to move these, the, they were called Freedom Campers because they were camping outside the, the Trafalgar Centre, uh, to offer them the one week free accommodation at the, at the Brook Camp as a way of incentivising them to leave without us having to use the um, Freedom Camping Bylaw and confiscate their tents, etc. Uh, and it was successful in that they moved up to the camp, then they caused a lot of trouble for a week and at the end of the week moved back to, the, to Rutherford Park. Um, so it wasn't a success and I'm not sure that we would do that again. I think next time we would just um, take a slightly harder line. But we were trialling something but I think it, it goes down in, in the fail category. That was us being bold. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Chief Executive. Uh, Mr Murray. Um, uh, thank you. Um, uh, th thank you for, uh, again, a, a, a good report. Um, they're all good reports um, today. Um, look, I just want to come back to 5.3, and as you know, this is a wee bit of a hobby horse of mine. Um, the um, uh, data about staff consultations, workplace support, um, which I was really sort of looking at and trying to get a gauge on mental health um, um, mental health within the organisation, within our staff, which was probably what I was looking at overall. And look, I appreciate that that's where that matter has got to and, and that it is a difficult um, sort of area, but the question isn't so much about the data, it's more more to, well, um, in our reports, um, uh, how can we have some sort of measure in here that, um, you know, our mental health um, amongst our workplace is OK? Um, is, is, I'm not even sure if there is anything, but it's, uh, it's as much an issue as is security at the Brook in terms of I'm, I'm concerned we get reported on that, or are we going too fast in our cars, we get that, or do I cut my hand in the workplace, we get that. How are we going with people in terms of their mental health and maintaining um, a good position on that? Uh, through the chair, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll attempt to answer that question. It's a little bit of a, of a, of a challenging one, and, and that's why that, that I included that report for a period there. But it, it didn't appear to work. Um, it, it was it didn't give us good information, and to give us better information would have breached confidentiality of, of some of the staff. Uh, we want that to be a, a service that they access freely. Uh, so as for gauging it, it is a challenge. I believe the um, the manager of people and capability is working on ways of reporting that better. Um, we're trying to find find ways to do that. Um, and for my part, I'm trying to focus on 
the prevention and so that's like not exposing staff to what they were exposed to at the Brook Camp as much as possible or, or supporting them at times like that um, to minimise the, the impacts when things, things don't go. Um, as the whole organisation is working on um, reducing those stresses, you know, managing the, the workloads, um, there's, there's a big focus and a lot of effort on that in, in prevention, but yeah, the actual measuring and reporting up front is, is a challenge. Um, and I'm open to any suggestions or ideas that, that might do that effectively. Thank you. So it is also a, a, topic, a topic of conversation that the Chief Executive's Employment Committee is the well-being of staff. And we are looking to um, use a, a different survey tool to um, uh, assess the, the culture of the organisation because that is a, is, a, is a critical factor, as we discussed, staff are the most important resource. Uh, turnover is another one that um, is, is dropping dramatically at the moment. Um, Uh, and uh, and the feedback I'm getting around the organisation is that the, the culture is, is changing. We have worked quite hard to um, uh, reduce workloads, um, and uh, and people know that the council is supportive of extra resources. They see a, a light at the, the end of the tunnel. Um, I think things are, are, are starting starting to lift s slowly. But again, it's a, it's not something that just changes over overnight. Thank you. Thank, thank you. My point um, is, is absolutely in support of that. Um, I just don't want to lose sight of the whole well-being um, factor within this, within the health and safety report, because I, I find it, I feel it's critical to the organisation, um, and uh, and um, just because that sort of set of data wasn't helping us, uh, well, we can't do that. And I fully appreciate that, and and, and um, that's a that's a reasonable outcome. Um, I'd just like to see that we keep our focus on it and if we can measure it and come back to the to the governance body around yep we are doing well in this space and I'd really welcome that. Thank you Mr Murray I think it's uh, it's important that we do that. Any further questions? Uh, Councillor Barker. Thank you Mr Chairman. <clears throat> I see that uh, quite a lot of uh, effort and the time has been put into a couple of problem areas <clears throat> that uh, exist within the well-being of our community. Homelessness and these people that are, have been living, or trying to live in council property, trespass notices have been issued. Are you on top of that? Uh, through the Chair, could just uh, clarify the question, which, in the ones that were at the book camp, is that what you're talking about? No, yes. no, no, I'm talking about the ones that you're mentioning in section 5.13. Oh, sorry. Trafalgar Park and other places like that. So, so through the chair, so the this is I guess has been a, a combined effort between uh, community partnerships team who, who developed the process for dealing with homeless people and about trying to get support for them in the first instance. The bit I've been involved with is is the trespass procedure, but we we consider trespass as, as a last resort. It's quite a drastic step to issue someone a notice forbidding them from what is essentially often a public place for two years. Um, and so we do that on the grounds of safety of, of staff. Um, often there is, there is other mechanisms in place. There, there's other legislation that can confiscate their camping equipment or in, infringement fines and stuff. The trespass is, is perhaps the mechanism to enforce that and, and gives the police powers of arrest around some of those other things once they're trespassed. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I, I can see that time is being spent into it and, and uh, yeah, I appreciate what you've explained to us. I'm happy with, the, with that uh, approach to continue. As long as when we need to, we, we can issue that trespass notice to protect our property, protect our people. The other area <coughs> is in libraries. And in your report, you mentioned uh, some of the, the problems that have been occurring at libraries. We had a workshop with the Community Services Committee where some of the young people that have been involved in problems at Stoke Library were present. and. Uh, I've been down, I live in Stoke, so I see what's happening there. And uh, I was rather surprised at how much money we're putting into to trying to deal with the, the problems that exist down there. But I've been very pleased. Last time I went past on Friday, I had a chat with the security officer. I suppose I shouldn't do this, but as a, as a resident of Stoke, I said, oh, how are things going down here? 
and his comment was that um, the work that the police have done has been amazing in sorting that out and getting rid of the the, the gang leaders, the, the, the real problem people. And that was very pleasing to hear. What's not so pleasant for me to hear is, is the amount of money we've had to put in to, to try and sort this, and it's an incredible amount of money. And um, on Friday, the young people of Stoke who were gathering there to, to have the free sausages and onions and, and bread and stuff, got a photo of it actually, it was, it was quite amazing. And it wasn't the, the problem people, I think it's got around, hey, council's feeding us, let's go to the library. So uh, I think we need to look at, um, are we deterring them or are we encouraging them with the way we do it? But it is pleasing to note that it seems that the, the problem has lessened because the harder line was taken with those who were the sort of the, the you know, the 80, 20 percent, the 20 percent of the causing the problems have been dealt with from what I hear. So, any comments to make on where we're heading at the libraries? Well, I, I'll perhaps uh, ask the Chief Executive to come in at that point. It's... So, yes, things are, are better at the libraries. Um, through a mixture of our security, the police and social workers, we have um, suppressed the symptoms at the moment. Uh, I think part of the longer term solution is, uh, is a discussion about a Stoke Youth Park. Uh, and we are asking for more money through the LTP process, and you, I think you'll be discussing that in the next couple of days about um, providing some, uh, some funding for another three years for a, a mixture of security and youth workers there uh, while we try and um, hand this over to some of the, more of the social agencies. Um, and we're involved because, directly involved because it is an issue affecting the safety of our staff at, at the library, and we need to make sure, sure they're safe and they feel safe walking to and from their cars, etc. Um, but you, you're quite right, it is uh, a problem that it's affecting, I'm aware of um, the children of staff members who won't walk past that area because of, of intimidation. So it is a bigger picture issue where we need more help from the government agencies as well. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Courtney. Thank you Mr Chairman, through you to Malcolm. Thank you for your presentation, your report. Are these people at Trafalgar Centre, are they mainly freedom campers or are they um, homeless people that you're moving up? Uh, through the Chair, they were defined as, as freedom campers uh, based on, on the various legislation that, 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 that would affect them uh, as, as to how Council would deal with them. They were treated... Um, yeah, I think they were offered some of the support that we offer to homeless people, but essentially they, the, the key difference I think in the definition is that they had tents. Uh, they, weren't, they weren't sleeping rough, they had camping gear, they were set up camping, and I believe some investigation was done and they did have other options. I think they, some of them had moved from another region to here. Um, yeah, so it's, yeah, you, the, the line gets blurry sometimes. You know, these people obviously appear to have a number of the issues that, that homeless people have as well, um, and different different set of criteria might, might give them a different definition. But it's, um... Can I just continue that through you? Malcolm, has your bold initiative of sending them up to the Brook Camp with a, a week's, week's voucher, has it worked previously? Yeah. And do you intend to keep it as part of your armoury going forward? I'm not aware that we've 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 tried that before, um, and I was warned when we tried it that that, that could have adverse uh, consequences at the Brock Camp, and it did. On oh, the manager, uh, I understand that some campers left, um, so it. it um, I think we would probably have to be more selective um, about if we were to offer that. It wouldn't be to a group of four, um, because just their mere presence in the kitchen wasn't wasn't was intimidating. Um, but we are trying to uh, work with these groups first, um, trying to find a, a social solution, uh, getting the Salvation Army involved. Um, but it is a challenge. Some of them have already been through alternative, uh, the alternative means of accommodation. They don't like the rules. Um, uh, yeah, and what we are noticing is that there are more, and they seem to be arriving. Nelson seems to be a... Um, Yes, a lot of these, these people are from, from out of town. 
Thank you, Chief Executive. <coughs> we sort of moved into the discussion area anyway without having put the report, so I'll, I'll continue down that, that path at this point, but uh, is there anything, anything further that anybody wants to raise? Just one, um, to what, one minor point, Malcolm, re relating to the report format, and I'm just looking at 2.1, the summary, uh, which, which sort of on the face of it looks like an extension of the, of the purpose of the report, and I wondered whether we're missing an opportunity there for you to have a space in which you can just provide a summary of sort of current issues or, or, or current things that, uh, uh, you know, maybe trending or something like that. So just a summary of the content of the report rather than a summary of the purpose of the report. It might just be a useful uh, place. It's just something to consider. I don't need a, a, a response to that at this point. So. Thank you. 